We were yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Whoop. Um. Hey everyone. Uh. By the way, I love that that is the beginning moment of the video portion of this. It makes me so happy. Hello, YouTube. This is uh, Mike Doyle and me on my podcast. And I'm going to read a really short bio of you, Mike Doyle, and then we're going to get into a conversation I've been so excited to have. So here we go. Um, hey, everyone. My guest today is Mike Doyle. Mike is a veteran actor with years of experience in film and television. On television, he has had long-running roles on Law & Order, SVU, City on a Hill, New Amsterdam, and many, many more. Some of his roles in films include Jersey Boys, The Invitation, You're Not You, Union Square, Rabbit Hole, and Green Lantern, just to name a few. As a writer-director, Mike's films include Shiner with Amy Ryan, Almost Love, starring Kate Walsh, Scott Evans, and Patricia Clarkson, and most recently, a film which I just got to see, Passing Through, which he made during COVID, and it has been racking up so many awards and nominations. I can't wait to get into that with you. Mike trained as an actor at the Juilliard School, and uh, truth be told, Mike is sitting in his apartment four blocks <laughs> wait for me right now and he asked should we do it in the same place I was like absolutely not <laughs> I wouldn't have it um I am thrilled to have you here I have been racking my brain trying to remember like the moment I first met you because it's very hard to, to like remember life without Mike Doyle at this point I don't want to remember life without Mike Doyle at this point <laughs> Well, I am very happy to be here. Uh, I, I've, I'm a long fan of the show and you, of course, uh, not only as my neighbor, um, but God, that's such an interesting question. When did we first meet? I want to say I have this vivid memory of us in the West Village, like maybe 2000 with Maddie. And we were like sitting on maybe West 4th and you were... I remember I remember feeling a little intimidated because Matt's world was, you know, he was he was he'd been acting for, you know, since he was five years old and had a lot of very successful friends, you amongst them. And I remember how immediately comfortable I felt with you. And I was like, oh my God, I feel like we've known each other for a long time. And I always, I mean, and then moving to this neighborhood several years ago when I was like, what am I doing with, you know, why did I pick this neighborhood in Brooklyn of all places? And I walked out really having just asked that question. And I walked a third of a block, quarter of a block, and you were standing on the corner and you're like, Mike Doyle, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, okay, I made the right decision moving to Brooklyn. Like it was such a, it was such a, I was so happy that that we were able to reconnect because I I felt connected to you. And you know, it's so funny, like me saying this to you, like I probably haven't shared this with you and now I'm sharing it with you on a podcast. And like, I'm asking myself, why haven't I shared this with Alana? Like you're one of those people that like, whenever I see you, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to talk about everything <laughs> because that's what we do. We talk... We we start with one thing and then we talk about everything. And like it just could go on and on and on forever. And it's just it's um I think you have a uh, a unique spirit and gift in in not only conversation but in friendship and um just being a great person. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was <laughs> that's all I needed. I think we're good. Are, are How's you... that for your truncated bio? <laughs> are you is it are, is it good for you? Because I feel like I'm good. Great. One for safety. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Mike Doyle, I am uh, right back at you. I guess is what I want to say. Um, I have been not just like when you talk about fandom. Like, by the way, the Matt that he was referring to. Should we say which Matt? it was or should we have our audience guess of all the like maths who started acting at five I years old in the world i mean uh we can say okay 
I Matthew McConaughey. Of, I know. I was trying to thank you. <laughs> That's what I was going for. Uh, perfect. It didn't um, come to me. A darker perfect. one came to me, but um, it's Matt McGrath. Yeah, yes, of course. The great Matt McGrath. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, I truly like. You know, as I said, that was like such a thumbnail sketch of your bio. And if one goes to IMDb, you'll see 100 credits. And I read seven, basically. <laughs> I mean, you really have like I was looking at your, you know, the phrase veteran actor. And it's so true. Like, I mean, veteran means so many different things. But there's something about like the wingspan of of the work you have accomplished over your lifetime thus far and you're always perfect you're like just always perfect in every wow. role you take on and I you know I think about you know people joke about you know you open up a playbill and it says law and order at the bottom um but really you are one of those people like you did law and order SVU for years I think you yeah. were like a forensics specialist um I was forensic technician, technician. Ryan O'Halloran yes you and were I a gun and I had a badge yes and I did it I was on for six years um long time Long time. And you would sort of pop in and out of the show. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a great job in that it was in New York, but it was a it was a uh, it was a hard job because of all the like technical jargon and you know you had to nail like on my first day. I've told this story many times, but I I said I I had to put the evidence in my gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And Ice-T was like, he's like, that sounds like you say that every day. And I was like, I have been for the last five, so I could say it today. But um, yeah, no, that was it. That was a great, that was a great run. And um, yeah. And also, I so I guess I wonder, you know, I think of things you've done, if you had to say, because then you've been on New Amsterdam, like network television is so pervasive in in our culture and in people's homes and so I wonder as you walk down the street like what is the thing that you find people notice you from the most that my fly is undone <laughs> for that you were great in that part as well yeah my fly is undone it sounds like a you know a Congreve play from restoration um they did that know, at Soho Playhouse <laughs> exactly <laughs> I um you know just back to your initial question or initial comment about being a veteran actor, because I think, uh, you know, I, I, I consider you and Dom and like a, a lot of our group veterans in that we've been doing this for decades. And, you know, I, I was on the picket line today and I was talking to Joel De La Fuente, who I worked with on SVU and John Conley you know, who have been like, we've been, um, I guess, journeymen that we, we've, we've had, uh, we've enjoyed like really lovely success, but it's never been, it's never been uh, uh, to a point where we couldn't walk down the street, for instance. So like, I feel like I'm super lucky because I mean, it's a, it's a, it's sort of a push pull because it's like, you want to have enough recognition that jobs come to you more easily. But at the same time, I've been so lucky because I've played so many different parts and so many different people. Like they allow me, they're like, oh yeah, you can play the crazy psychotic or you could play the sweet romantic or you could play the, the gay husband or the straight husband. And it's, I feel really i don't walk around with like oh i'm so fortunate but like when i stop and take a moment as we are now like i feel really lucky because i you know it's a hard it's a hard business and all we want to do is tell stories in different ways and you know use our bodies to do it sometimes use our minds to write or direct them in other times um so, so it's like, I, I, I do feel 
like walking that picket line, seeing, you know, every day you just see friends like that you've known for years just because we've, we're veterans, you know, yeah, we've yeah. survived, we've yeah. survived. And, um, and I think that's like really rarefied air to breathe. And, and, you know, I get recognized infrequently, um, but you know, enough. And it's always best when you're with like a cousin from out of town or yeah. <laughs> your mother, because it's like a tree falling, like if it's totally. around, like who cares? But yeah. it's usually, um, it's usually Oz, uh, which I did many years ago, uh, SVU a, a bit because it repeats all the time. And now New Amsterdam, because it's on, you know, it's streaming everywhere. Right. You know, there are a lot of people, but I, the, the people who are, uh, nice enough to come up and say something are always, uh, super respectful, very kind. And, um, it's it's nice you know well I was thinking about you know Oz of course and then another role you did recently opposite Kelly O'Hara in the accidental wolf which is also like you know Ariane Moyette created this really beautiful dark incredibly interesting mini series it's made for streaming basically i don't yeah. even know what to call it yeah. exactly um which i was such a fan of and also just i think about you know when you think of all the different roles you do it's the people you collect along the way like yeah the kelly yeah. wolf who you know who played your wife and the and the amy ryan who you know we love who i just got to see in this movie you made uh yeah. playing your sister and and Passing Through is a movie, you know, I told Mike, I mean, I wanted to have you on the podcast for so long, but really when I just saw the screening of this film, was it the Soho International uh, Film Festival? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in this big theater on this huge screen filled with an audience who have just a tiny bit of distance from the pandemic, uh, Yet the minute you're reminded of it, it all comes flooding back in a way that other traumas are are more in the rearview mirror still. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to, I mean, I want to talk about how you ended up at Juilliard and, and what you used to audition to get in there and when you wanted to be an actor and how you knew. And were you a model growing up? I'm trying to remember sort of the early showbiz. I mean, model is, is one way of saying I did print work because I fit the I fit the fit size of like I think it was a boy's size 18 which was mm -hmm. like the catalog clothing so I started doing that when I was like 14 years old because in I Connecticut fit the in Connecticut and then in New York so I was like coming down I mean it's so insane that I was like 15 years old, like taking Metro North and the subway into New York City of the late 80s and just being like, yeah, I'll get to that go see. And well, I was like, how did you know to do that? I, you know, I figured it out. I, I, I had a brother who was always um interested in acting and like was always like coming up with these crazy cockamamie schemes of like stuffing envelopes to like make money like to buy grandma and el dorado i'm like i don't think we're gonna get that much money a lot of envelopes <laughs> it is um can you hear that wait sorry they're doing construction next door. I think it should be okay. I it's just... totally fine. Okay. They have been drilling into the walls of this building for two years. And <laughs> I'm always so self-conscious. Like this studio is supposed to be soundproof, but what could possibly withstand <laughs> that? And then I listen to it and I'm like, huh, God bless Zoom. Yeah, not so bad. Not so uh, bad. Yeah. So yeah, so I I just like, I saw some ad in the newspaper and I'm like, I want to try that. And it, uh, I've never really thought about why I started doing it. I think if I'm going to do a deep dive here, I think as a kid, 
uh, you know, I was a child of divorce and, um, uh, and I don't think I ever felt seen in the way that I wanted to be seen. And so I, you know, obviously I gravitated towards something that was so obvious, like someone will take your picture and you'll be in a catalog. Um, so I think I was just desperate to be seen. Um, and I also like, you know, I knew from an early age that I was gay, although I didn't identify, you know, it was a different time. You know, I wasn't out as a, you know, as a 12 or 13 year old, but I knew that I was different and that sort of kept me, well, bullied for a time, but marginalized. And I, I wanted to, I mean, it's why I became an actor too, because it was something I was good at and it was something and so I just slowly, I, I took some pictures, which I think I still have, and they are atrocious. I sent them to this agency and, you know, it was passed on. And then I took some other pictures that were better. And I worked with this, uh, this agency in Connecticut called the Joanna Lawrence Agency. And I did, like, there was, um, the catalog work in Connecticut was like Reed's Coles, I don't think was around Caldor. Like there were some small things. Right. And then I built that up into something that I could take to New York. And then I ended up, I was with the Ford agency in the kids division. And that, you know, I, in my junior and senior year, I didn't have a last period. I would, I would get myself one thing that my mom said, she was like, if you want to do this, it's on your own. And I'm like, okay. We didn't have a train station in our town. I'd have to like either take a taxi or ride a bicycle to it. And then I would go down. I had my little portfolio. Right. I, I have, I actually have a formula. I still have it that, you know, before Google maps, like if you said, oh, it's at 625 7th Avenue, there's an actual formula to give you the cross street. You take off the last number, you divide by two. Sorry, I'm going into such a deep. No, 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 no. But come on, um, Rain but, Man. <laughs> I, but I, I figured it out somehow, and I look back like wow. at that 15 year old, and I'm like, how the hell did you do that? And um, and then I started. Uh, you know, I was always acting as a kid. It's something I loved. Uh, but then I was encouraged to sort of do it on the side and pursue academics, and which I did. Um, and. I went to college not knowing what the hell I wanted to do. And the junior year of my, uh, the, my junior year, I got cast in Midsummer Night's Dream. And that was a turning point for me. And I'm like, you know what? I think I want to, after I graduate, I want to go to New this. York and give this a shot. Yeah. You went to Georgetown? I did. Yeah. And mm -hmm. was there a theater department there or you were just able, you could, you, you were political science? Major? Uh, economics. economics economics major yeah that's right because i said to you the other day you're so smart <laughs> do you remember that like over and over again i was like you're so smart no all i remember is supply and demand <laughs> <laughs> well supply um, and demand is still a thing has not yeah. changed so you're at georgetown you audition you get this play yeah. do you fall into a community of yeah. theater lovers uh, in college people. yeah yeah Steve DeRosa was at Georgetown at the same time ahead of me. And like he was in Georgetown didn't have a BFA program at the time. They do now. So yeah. what was wonderful is that it was open to everyone. Right. And it was just uh, it was called Mask and Bauble. And um, I didn't know what a bauble was when I <laughs> when I first Wait, mask joined. and and bauble? B a u b l e bauble like a little bauble like a yeah like baubles a, bangles and beads that's what it was I wonder why that was the name of a theater company just in in honor of like costuming 
Mask and bubble. Mask and bubble. <laughs> okay. That's good. I Let's know. open. I want us to open up a cafe in our neighborhood <laughs> called Mask and Bubble. It's going to be fantastic, you guys. Next time you're in Brooklyn, stop yeah, by. Exactly. Come to Mask um, and Bubble. Come to Mask and Bubble. Bubble tea. Um, bubble tea. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, but it was just a, it was just like a bunch of misfit toys, and we there were you know there were the big productions, there were smaller productions uh you know sometimes i had great parts and then other times uh in equus for instance i was cast as a horse not the horse just a horse no small in- parts mike no well, small parts yeah <laughs> just small horses uh and you know uh, my brother who i referenced before be- he now lives in california has a family he's a physical therapist but he was going he went to american academy of dramatic arts for a year went to nyu and he was living in new york and trying to be an actor and so i already had like uh, a representative who was like sending me up for commercials and print stuff so i sort of had a little bit of a foot in the in the world and he was doing it. And I told him, I said, I remember this conversation. I said, I think after I graduate, I'm gonna come to New York. And he said, don't do it. He said, don't do it unless you really, really are ready to pursue it and know what it entails. And and I, you know, I say that to kids now because like, if me saying that stops them, then they shouldn't do it. Um, and I moved, I moved to New York. I became a waiter, did a Meisner program for two years. And at the end of it, I was like, I need some more questions answered. And I applied to Yale to their master's program and I didn't get in. And then the following year, uh, someone suggested that I apply to Juilliard and NYU's grad program. And I, and I did Yale again the three of them, I didn't get into Yale a second time, but I got into NYU and Juilliard. And, um, and I was, you know, talking with John Connolly today and Joel, their class was graduating when I was looking. So I saw, I saw this production with John, Peter Rini, Billy Crudup in the black box at, what is it? Five something Broadway at NYU. I saw Robin Weigert in this play. It was, <laughs> Also in a very small theater, it was a snake handler play and they had actual snakes. And then I went to Juilliard and Carrie Preston was playing Sonia in Uncle Vanya on the main stage. And they had this this Persian rug that was probably like 30 feet by 60 feet. And I just said, I want to act on that. Because <laughs> I want to act on that rug. Aesthetic, as we know, uh, for those of you who haven't yet been to Mike's apartment, you'll know he has exquisite taste. Oh, also, wow, Carrie Preston sweet. was just on the on the picket line. Like these people are still. Yeah, we were. I actually here. saw her today. Yeah. Yeah. She's, yeah. God, I mean, that's what's so incredible. Sort of the community. I love. It's also random, right? Like I would prefer to act on that rug than with a snake, and <laughs> and therefore I ended up at Juilliard. When you look back at your time there, uh, you know I've had a lot of people on this podcast with all different kinds of relationships to their time at Juilliard. None of them came away going, "If I had to do it again, I wouldn't go there." Almost to a person. All of them coming away with, I wish then I knew to advocate for myself in this way or to protect myself in a certain way. Um, What what would you say to that years later and sort of your experience being in in such an intense acting program? Usually when people ask me, how was Juilliard? I I always say the short answer is it was great. The longer answer is, you know, do you have a couple of hours? Yeah. Um, It, you know, training programs, you know, and training is so different now uh, than it was then, especially in light of the last, you know, three, four years. Right. Um, You know, we were taught how to speak um, with distinction, it was called, but there was good speech 
and then there was everything else um right. and they don't teach that anymore and right. which is good but yeah. i mean one of the things you know one of, i was fortunate because i had my own apartment i had my own life i started when i was 24 i was the old guy in class mm -hmm. at 24 now they take people who are all sorts of ages but then like 24 was like that was the kind of Lo logan's run they're gonna right. shoot you <laughs> Um, you just made it. You just, just made, made it. it. Yeah. I was like putting, I was like, I'm 24. No, I mean, I was. But <laughs> just a little bit of tape and exactly. some soft lighting. Exactly. Um, and so I had, well, first of all, I had a Jesuit education under my belt where uh, the, the, the fundamentals of uh, Jesuit education are to question and to challenge. And so the problem, so Juilliard is a wonderful place, a wonderful place where I needed and wanted to go because you're creatively, um, you're, you're creatively living 13 hours a day, five days a week. Um, what can happen because there are kids, you know, my dear friend of mine who's in my movie Kevin classmate he was 17 he was in he was a young graduate of high school he hadn't lived away from home you know he had so his experience was very different from mine you know he, learning who he was while at the same time being in a place where they were telling you <laughs> who you should be. I mean, ostensibly, they're not telling you who you should, who you should be, but. Right. But they were, know. I mean, it's, were. it's in the ether of the, yeah. wait, what's Kevin's last name? I'm blanking on, not James. Uh, Daniels. Kevin Daniels. Daniels. Uh, yeah. He's such a beautiful actor. What an extraordinarily oh, yeah. beautiful actor. And we'll talk about him when we get to your film in yeah, a little he's, bit. He's just a, and a lovely lovely person <laughs> spirit just yes amazing. and the idea that i said kevin james if you put the two actors photos up next to each other um i You'd be like hmm no no <laughs> wrong one um also uh i love that now that i understand like how long your history is with him yeah. and why you, those scenes that are so intimate and beautiful in your film you know, that you had to shoot very quickly, why there's so much um, depth uh, yeah. between yeah. the two of you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so sounds like you have a very, in hindsight, um, healthy relationship to that experience at that time. I do, I, I you know, I do. And, and again, because I felt like I knew what I was there for, I knew what I wanted, I wasn't afraid to be like, mm -hmm, I, that doesn't work for me. Or like, why am I constantly being cast as the servant? Like I need some media roles. Right. Uh, I knew how to advocate for myself. And in fact, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, I went back because um, I directed a short film. They, they commissioned three writers and three directors to make three short films for their graduating class. And it was really great to go back um and and see how the training had changed and see uh what it meant to be a Juilliard actor in 2022 versus mm -hmm. you know when I was there and 1902 um, <laughs> 1892 <laughs> uh yeah but you know overall I would not uh, to, to to your to your point of your previous guest I would, I would, I do not regret having gone and I would 100% go again. What was your kind of big, I feel like if you, it, it might be hard for you to name, but do you feel like, you know what my break was? My big break came when. In general. Uh, yeah, I do know what that is. Uh, between my second and third year at school, I, I was like, you weren't allowed to really audition, but I was sort of secretly auditioning in the spring. And I, I screen tested for this Disney movie that 
Bob Dylan's son directed, Jacob Dylan maybe, called Meet the Deedles. And I didn't, I like, I went like a bunch of times back. It was a Disney movie and Paul Walker got it, the part that I was up for. And I remember, and the feedback was, because I was devastated when I didn't get it, but the feedback was they could, I'm paraphrasing now because it's in my denial, my hard drive of denial or of forget, uh, was that they couldn't gauge my sexual energy. And the part was this, it's this ridiculous comedy, these like two surfer dudes. And like, I guess I was, but I, but I, I took that and I was like, oh, I was like, is that code for he seems gay? Or is it more like what I think it was? I was hiding. And by doing that, I completely cut off any sort of sexuality. I don't, they weren't saying like, oh, he reads gay, but it was like, we're not getting a sexual vibe. And I think, like, as you know, like, that's so important. Uh, in sta- on the stage, in TV and film, like there has to be, like there's got to be a sensuality, a sexuality, like however it manifests itself. Right, right. And <clears throat> so anyway, you asked me what my big break was. Um, so shortly thereafter, I booked the lead of a of a movie of the week called A Loss of Innocence. It was a Mormon tragic love story set in the 20s starring Jenny Garth and Rob Besties. She's my wife. I'm a dairy farmer. He's my half-brother who teaches piano, teaches my wife, Jenny. They fall in love. We go out on a deer hunting uh, expedition and he shoots me dead because she forgot to pack my jacket. (laughs) So, and then I went right into that. Those producers that summer were doing the mini series of Titanic because it was the summer of 96. So they were racing to get a television. Uh, the television uh, version. Yeah. Yeah. And I played the Leonardo DiCaprio role, but I was, my name was Jamie Purse and I was English. And um, that miniseries sank just like the Titanic. <laughs> it's but you Catherine were the Zeta lead. Jones. Yeah, it wow. was great. Catherine Gita Jones was in it. Peter Gallagher, Tim Curry, George C. Scott, even Marie Saint. It was like Roger Reese. It was like, it was huge. Wow. And wow. and then I, you know, and then I went back to school, and um, and that was a thing that sort of changed uh, a lot of things for me. That opened up more opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. So I think about you know, I mean. I remember seeing you in Jersey boys and just going, Oh my God, like, like there's Mike in this huge Clint Eastwood movie and, and thinking about the Clint Eastwoods and the Nancy Savokas, like these incredible directors you've worked with along the way um, on television and, and, and on film and wondering sort of as you, which I just love about you. Like you are always creating, like you are an actor who's always working because even when you're not on a set that someone else has hired you for, you have really just loved making stuff. And some of it's fun and silly just, you know, to spend an afternoon. And then some of it has ended up to be like these powerful, wonderful movies. One of them, like there's, I think it was called Sell By, right? Originally. And then it Mm -hmm. became almost, Correct. On Netflix, like, like, you know, you're doing it, it's happening. And I wonder if you think back to, I mean, I mentioned two very famous directors who could not be more different in terms of Mm -hmm. like, indie world and big feature film world. Are there things because now I really want to do get into your latest film. Are there things that certain directors taught you? Like, can we use Clint for an example? I want to know if you had to audition for the Jersey Boys movie. And and <clears throat> what is the process like for a Clint Eastwood movie? What's the process for Nancy Savo, you know, an indie darlings movie and what you took from 
those two, just for example, um, yeah. into your own directing life? That's a well, three-part question. Yes. <laughs> this um, universe. <laughs> I didn't go to film school. So, but I, I, I don't know who it was who told me, but just as like, I became acutely aware that like I was in film school. I was at a film school every time I went to work. And so I really, you know, when, when you work on, you know, for instance, a show for six years, each set is different when a new director comes in and it's a new script. So while it's the same show, you get the experience of, of observing so many people and so I would, you know, I would tell the person who was standing in for me, I'm like, I'll stand in for this, you know, this scene or the shot, because I want to see why, what is he doing and how is he going to get this piece of storytelling? And then I shadowed a lot of directors along the way, but always when I'm on a set and you've been on sets where things work really well, and then sets where things don't work as well. And I, I, for me, it feels, it's always set, the tone is set by the director and everything sort of trickles down from there. And so I would watch the people I love, like Nancy and uh, Clint Eastwood are fantastic examples. Karn Kusama, who did the invitation that I was in. And the experiences were very different. Nancy, she shot this feature in 12 days in an apartment on Union Square. Clint, it was a big Warner Brothers movie uh, that I did have to audition for. Um, didn't meet him till seven weeks later. We're on set because he doesn't meet people in person. Uh, and then I had to remember what I had done that he responded to because you don't have the benefit of workshop, you know, auditioning is sort of workshopping an idea and you learn in, along in the process, like, oh, they respond to this, this works, like this is the character, but you don't have that with him. But what you do have is you have someone who loves actors and trusts them and his crew is the same way. Like they're all there, it's this organism. And so you feel this incredible amount of freedom to make a big bold choice because he's entrusted you to do so and like he lets you fly he lets you soar and that was a huge learning experience for me as a as a directing lesson because i feel like my job is to create the space where people feel safe to try fail and fly and and everybody needs something different and um you know you you don't direct any one actor the same way because everyone's needs are different um and so i was uh, to answer your question i learned from real masters karen for instance you know, that we shot this uh, semi-single location uh, in a month, an ensemble of nine lead actors who had to navigate through a party. And while we're doing pre-production and wardrobe fittings and all sorts of stuff, she's like, let's have rehearsal. We'll just stumble through. So we're not, you know, the experience of meeting someone like, you know, your husband of 30 years, you meet for the first time you know, on a set and you're, you know, you're supposed to do the divorce scene. You know, she wanted us to meet before right. we actually, you know, we're working together. And then during that time, she and the two writers, one of whom was her husband and his longtime writing partner, they're like, think of us as a three-pronged brain and come to us with any questions you have. And so it's wow. just this lovely open collaboration. Yeah. But also, she was um, a, a fearless and auspicious leader that whom we trusted. 
and we knew had a plan. So it wasn't like, ah, what do you think? It, it Not that kind of collaboration. It was, okay, let's take that and build together. And I can't, I can't say, you know, enough about Karen. She's an incredible, incredible artist. Well, thinking to like, and then you are walking on a set whether you're in the piece or just directing, writing the piece with really famous people, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and so, so, and also people who were predominantly like comedians before coming onto your set. Like you've worked with a lot of different kinds of people, um, you know, from Patty Clarkson to Kate Wall. You know, we I've listed so many of the people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, I forgot to mention that Mike, another thing he did was work with Lena Dunham because she directed the um, music video for Jack Antonoff's uh, I Want to Get Better. Is that the name of the yeah. song? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want you to press pause and go just watch that video when <laughs> with with Bleachers is was his is he i don't know if that's still an act yeah that's still his band bleachers uh, yeah he's that's his solo he was with his, uh, right Farm. yeah before <clears throat> becoming just so famous because he and taylor swift are so yeah uh married musically um and so i want you know so lena must be another voice in terms of watching someone you know yeah in she's creative she's setting. incredible yeah my my boyfriend andrew at the time was working with her and, and she just approached me and uh, she said, I, she's like, I'm making this, uh, I'm directing this video for Jack and I just want to see you as like a beaten down husband. And so Retta is my, uh, my wife and we're in couples counseling. And for me, being in a music video, when you talk about like dreams as a kid, that's all I ever wanted to do and after I did that video I'm like I'm good I'm done like it was Mary Kay Place is in it <laughs> like it's just I mean it's it, it's such a fun video and Jack is fantastic and um we shot it in a day I think uh out in LA and it was just it, I couldn't be happier like the sequence where we're playing instruments and we had choreography it's just incredible no i mean we grew up i mean if you know mtv and watching all those videos and christy brinkley on billy joel's motorcycle and now mm -hmm. you like <laughs> you are in that video and i just have to ask that line at the end where you say great timing i just got out of a coma um <laughs> Did you make that up or was that scripted? That, that just improvised. seems so you. That, <laughs> that was improvised, yes. <laughs> that is my genius friend, Mike Doyle. Um, anyway, if if you if you're back with us now because you went to watch the video and now you're <laughs> returning back. to us, welcome back. Uh, after that short break, am I right? Though was Mike not a total hilarious genius in that? <laughs> um, so a few weeks ago, I got to see Mike's movie uh, passing through. And I just want you to talk about what the process was of making a COVID movie during COVID. And I don't want to call it a COVID movie. And in any way, have you, listener, think that it is like a movie that only works in that context? Because really, it's just, it's about love and longing and connection right yeah. or lack of connection at a certain time in life and so that happens to be the backdrop but but I don't want my calling it that to in any way keep you from watching this film because it's just so yeah. beautiful you know it's funny because I really tried to distance it completely from COVID uh in the beginning and then I was like no I it's the it's the it's the infrastructure on which it hangs and right. So I mean, it's I'd the, like it's the say, inciting incident in that yeah. way. I mean, it's the catalyst I, for your character's story. Yeah. And I guess I would call it COVID adjacent um, because, yes, it is. <laughs> it's, I think uh, that's fair. Let us call it COVID adjacent. We're yes. in the flats. We're not in yes. Beverly Hills. We're in the flats. It's, we're adjacent. Uh, so that came out of. Yeah, I had made the first feature more traditionally, uh, raised money, you know, had big cast, big crew. 
a bigger budget, not huge budget. And, um, and then during COVID, uh, you know, I was locked down like everybody and just sort of creatively uh, thirsty. And I wanted to see my family. So I thought, you know, this is in May. <clears throat> how do I get to California? They're living there now. How do I get there safely? And I was like, oh, I will rent a car. I'll drive and I'll camp in the woods. I've camped, <laughs> not a camper, but I'm like, I, I will figure it out because I wanted to like bump up against something. I needed to be challenged. So I ordered a tent on Amazon and a cooking stove and I set it up in the apartment and I was having trouble with the stove and I slept in it one night and the next morning I had this idea. And then I just let this idea sort of percolate and I'm like, I think there's a story in here and I want to try to tell it. And it was always a feature. It was never a short um, because it was, it would be too cumbersome as a short. I mean, as a feature, it's, you know, 72 minutes. So it's a shorter feature. Uh, but so then I just sort of builds out what that story could be. And at the same time, I was really affected by um, just the news of frontline workers dying by suicide or death by neglect. And so that resonated with me. And, and then, you know, I knew other people had to be in it. Kevin was the first part I wrote in it because I knew that there was a relationship. I knew that I knew the end. I knew that there was going to be like that, you know, that there was going to be a flip at the end. And then I added the character of the sister, Amy, who Amy plays and you know, I was lucky enough. I, you know, I did that after. So I went on this cross country trip uh, across 14 states over 10 days. And I would get up every morning. I had a tripod. I had a gimbal. I had external hard drives and like stuff to hook it up to the, to the car because you can't keep, I was shooting in 4k. Oh, and I shot on my iPhone. <laughs> Forgot to add that. <laughs> but it was a lot of um, data that I had to dump every day. But every morning I'd get up and be like, okay, I'm gonna shoot this scene, spend three, four hours or shoot multiple scenes. And then, um, but it was scary because it was my second feature. And so I definitely had put a lot of pressure on myself or what that should mean, what it should signify, and what I should achieve as a result of it. And I had to get rid of all of that. And I ultimately it was like, this is an experiment. And I'm I, and I am willing, I said this every day, I am willing to throw it away and press delete at any stage of the game where it's not working. And I almost did. I mean, many times, but you know, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> I'm so glad you didn't too. And obviously, I mean, I think so much about how isolated people feel. I mean, all the time yeah. that that happens to be something that more people experience during the pandemic, but it's a way of life for many, many people. Um, mm -hmm. But heightened by you're taking yourself on a road trip alone. So all of yeah. the comforts and distractions of home that we have, um, yeah. you stripped away from yourself. Just, I mean, not COVID, driving cross country by yourself. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm like, I took a walk alone today. Good for me, <laughs> right? Like, you know, we have, we as people all have very different <clears throat> and relationships to being alone or or carving out time to be with oneself so are you a someone who's generally comfortable in your own company and what surprised you about being 
away in your own company with no distractions of people you knew for almost two weeks in strange places, camping, no beautiful carpet uh, that no. Carrie Preston was was acting <laughs> on. Like, like, just talk a little bit about being scared, lonely. Uh, were you worried, like, at any point did you think you had COVID, but you were alone on this trip? Like, anything that comes to mind? It was... Yeah, I mean, I had a hunting knife that I also bought on Amazon and I had a bear whistle. So I had, I would sleep. So you were set. <laughs> I'm good. You guys, I'm good. <laughs> that seems like uh, also good Halloween costume stuff that I'll, <laughs> I'm going to borrow from you later. Okay. I was, I was, I was nervous uh, about many things. Um, you know, I didn't want to, because nobody was really out and about and, traditional campgrounds were closed. So I was staying in national forests where the rule is, as long as you're not blocking a road, you can camp wherever. So you'd find in the forest, you'd find like a dirt path. And at the end of which there was like a, a ring of rocks where someone had a fire. So you're like, all right, people camp here. But I like every night I would be like, where am I going to stay? Like, there's no, like, there's no, like, uh, I mean, I'm sure there is campsites.com, but like, there's no like, you know, random campsites.com that like, and I'm sure, I'm sure there are, someone's going to be like, but yeah, Mike, think um, about little Mike who came into the city and figured out like, <laughs> if I divide, I take the last number off the street address and divide it by two. And that's where my audition yeah. is today. Like, like I you're good at I this. Of, I don't think I was thinking about him at all. I think I was oh. thinking about adult. But he was, was, he was with you. Know, you. I hope right. so. But, but then I was also like adult Mike, like I would find a spot and I'd be like, eh, see if I can do better. So I was like already upgrading my room. Oh. Um, but I found these places and I just was scared that, you know, I wasn't going to, you know, disturb the, you know, the, the, the lemur colony that was there or the, you know, the jaguars. I mean, they not jaguars. Obviously, or or less America. exotic bears. Yes. Or, or folks who might be holding a rally for something that was not in my best interest. Like exactly. Uh, so that was not without stress, but also like camping is a little boring. <laughs> Like you, you go to sleep when the sun sets right. and you wake up when the sun rises. Like I had my little, uh, stovetop, stovetop coffee maker. I bought all this, you know, food packaged and canned, you know, so I didn't have to stop. So I would cook, you know, my Trader Joe's chili and stuff, but making the film gave me something to do every day. That was like right. really fun. Cause I'm just like, Oh, I'm going to set up the tripod here and maybe, you know, like, and it was a great lesson for me because, you know, when you're directing, you're working with a cinematographer who is there and will make sure that the pieces, that you have the pieces to put together to assemble right. a scene. Right. They're thinking of the editor. I mean, they're they're already yes. on the other and side of this process. Yeah. I try to do that. One of the directors that I worked as an actor with, Graham Clifford, he used to be an, a, an editor and then became a director. And I learned, I was like, He's like, I'd be like, oh, I messed up in that take. And he's like, I'm only using the first part and the last part. I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I'm going to edit that part out. And I learned that that was on the Jenny Garth thing years ago. So to think like an editor and think of like how to assemble a scene and like how you cover or not cover. And um, it was a real, it was a real learning lesson. And then just to cut to you know, many months later when we're editing it, what always happens to a director in an editing room is you're like, oh, if only I had an insert of the hand or if only I had a reverse reaction. And when I would get to those moments, I'd be like, oh, let me get my camera crew. iPhone 13. And I just, right. I would just film it. Like I went yeah. to, in the backyard of Brooklyn that when it's when it's all sort of grown in, you can, depending on the angle, it looks like you're in the forest. And so I was able to correct my mistakes, but also like, oh, next time, don't forget, you know, you're, don't, you know, think of all the different pieces. Right, so. right. 
had you downloaded like a whole bunch of movies to watch on your phone along the way? Like, did you have comfort media? I, like, or no? I didn't. No, because you had was, your dailies each day. Well, I as did. It were? I had I had to dump them at the end of the day. I didn't watch yeah. them, but I also was like protecting the battery. You know, like I had to keep everything charged. And uh, I read like I had a book that I was reading. And, you know, but camping is hard, like you, you know, and I was also driving. So I was, you know, a lot of the day, six hours, five, six hours, I was driving somewhere and then setting up your camp and then cooking your dinner and then washing your plate. Like it takes a lot, like frontier living ain't ain't easy. You, you, Laura Ingalls, were exhausted (laughs) by seven, basically, as soon as the light was done. So when you watched, you know, I I went to this premiere, I got to sit with you and Amy Ryan, who hadn't seen it yet. And so it was wild sort of to be so close to her response to seeing it, even though she knew so much about it and had been in it. um, That must have felt really wonderful that she felt so moved by it. It did. I, I mean, before that, it was I was very anxious because I hadn't had a chance to screen it for her. And, you know, when you ask a friend, you know, and I also when I asked her, I was like, I was like, I'll shoot you out in three hours. I was like, come down to Brooklyn. In, wait, in how long? Three hours. Oh, three hours. Three That's hours. a good job. Yeah. Yeah. And but the night before I sent her, you know, that monologue basically so I send her all these pages and she's like okay and she was game she was down for it and I but I hadn't shown it to her and I'm like I was I just wanted to I was so worried that she wouldn't like it or the audience wouldn't like it or it wouldn't resonate um and And so like that screening particularly because it premiered in Italy and I think because of the language barrier, it, it, it seemed to play well there, but I, I couldn't sort of sense the energy like I could that Right, It was hard to gauge. Yeah. And it was, you know, Amy was next to me and, you know, she was visibly moved by it and that felt, that felt great. It felt really good. Now, this movie is not for everyone and you know uh well it's not for monster people (laughs) but i would disagree unless you're a monster i don't i don't know why i mean you you can you can expound upon that thought but i think it is for everyone like if you have a heart in your body that's still beating it's very much for you it's so beautiful mike thank you thank you i i Thank you very much for saying that. I, I guess because it's um, it's it's particular in its um, delivery, mm-hmm. and I, I think I'm in many ways still processing, you know, what the film is, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, you know, a director once said, you know. I don't make movies for everyone because if I made a movie for everyone, I'd make a movie for no one, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think I understand what that means. But like, you know, I, I was interested in, in, in trying some new things out and making some bold swings. Um, The first time I've been in something of my own that I've directed, which was, was like, so like the last thing in my mind every day like I wasn't even thinking like you know because if I were directing me I'd be like you might want to do another one you know and act a little better but I just needed better to get the, yeah I needed to get the pieces and you know ultimately we were able to craft that into a performance um and but uh but yeah it's um I, I I like working on smaller scales, like as an actor, I love working on an indie film that that is like where someone's done their homework and there's support and there's a great script. 
as you know, my first feature was sort of a version of that, but you know, much bigger than passing through. Right. And and passing through really was the distillation of like working, you know, on the smallest scale possible. Um that said, I think I missed, you know, I miss like having a crew. Having, and also you know. a community, you know, so much of what's so much, I mean, making stuff can be hard and rigorous and you're freezing or you're boiling hot or it's a night shoot. And, you know, there are so many things around us that, that contribute to a hard shoot or a happy shoot on any given day. But the constant is a community that is yeah. built around that project. And I think for people like you and me who really love people and, and conversations, as you said earlier, like you don't know where it's going to go. I mean, the magic of being on a set, even though the long hours and the waiting in between shots, that's where you have the most incredible conversations with other artists. Yeah. It's four in the morning. You're so friggin' tired and cold, yeah. yet you're sitting next to someone who you could quote back to me 15 years later, like I had this incredible conversation with so-and-so and it's yeah. still with me to this day. It's why yeah. all of these wonderful people do your films because you've worked with them in the past and they've just had a remarkable, remarkable time making a new friend in Mike Doyle along the way. Um, but you were alone most yeah. of the time in the making mm -hmm. of this thing. And mm -hmm. I just think that's a really, you know, so a, no one to say if it was good or not good, or, you know, give you feedback yeah. in the moment. I also think like, yeah, not for nothing to, I was really proud of you for casting yourself in this thing sort of as an exercise, yeah. which as you said, you could hit delete and erase the tape at any time, but you didn't. And I'm so glad you didn't because it's a lot to um, look at ourselves on this Zoom for 40 minutes, mm -hmm. let alone have to watch yourself, I mean, for 70 minutes and also yeah. to be in the edit and to have any objectivity about it. And I guess yeah. what I was saying to the people sitting around me, you know, our mutual friends. Um, it's like, I couldn't, I mean, I literally couldn't take my eyes off of you because there was nothing else to look at, but also, <laughs> but also like you with, with very few moments of the film, including other people, um, like Mike, you really, it's like you, it's riveting. You really hold our Thanks. attention. Thank um, you. It's, <clears throat> it's a really thrilling thing. And I was just like, wow, that's, at first I thought, oh, that's so brave. And then I thought, no, he's just so lost in this story. Like it's no longer about brave or not brave. It's like, you're an artist, like you're a true artist. And oh, um, well, thank you. You're so welcome. And I feel like what a great thing to give yourself an opportunity to be in something this good from beginning to end. Right. Like nice. not to just show up for a couple of days in some great, right. movie, but like right. to be in it the whole time. I can only imagine like the learning process for you, like not just holding the film, like literally holding this film. So yeah. I just want to say huge congrats. I know you're at the very beginning of the journey with this movie. And and when this comes out, it may not, you know, we might have to set up a postscript about how more people get to see it at the yeah. time. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, because I know you have a million other projects already percolating. No, in I'm your good. Head. I can I could talk with you for hours. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Um, <laughs> let me let me uh, let me ask you this. One, uh, let me thank you for this. Um, oh, please. You My have pleasure. been well. Thank you for this. Thank you for your movie. Thank you for your work. But you have also been. Thank you I for think, being a friend. <laughs> truly, <laughs> I think as we record this on October thirty first, it is the hundredth and what day of the Screen Actors Guild strike? One ten. One oh nine. One ten. One oh nine. One ten. On yeah. the heels of a uh, a long Writers Guild strike, the other yeah. union. Yeah that you are lucky to pay dues to as well. <laughs> um, I am I am just so in awe of your showing up every day, rain or shine, like the well, postal I service. Well, I tried, I don't show up. It's not 
every okay. day. But, I don't want to be hyperbolic. I, <laughs> a lot. A lot. I, yeah. I, you know, it's, I, I say, you know, F. Murray Abraham, who's 82 years old, shows up Freaking. every day. Yeah. And if he can do it, then, you know, I can go out and support. Uh, just, you know, sidebar, the um, passing through was shot on a uh, micro budget SAG contract. So we're able to talk and yes. promote and all that kind yes. of stuff. Yes. Um, just, you know. But thank you to, for pointing that yeah. out. I, I, I was going to all. say that at the beginning and now I don't have to. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, um, but look, we're in a, we're in a, um, we're in a uh, a very particular time in terms of workers and corporations, and it's important that we fight for what is right. And Can we did elaborate? it with the writer's guild. Yes, yeah. if you were if you were at the table today, and and literally could say like. In, in very basic terms, this is why I have been striking every day, as opposed to for what is right. Like, mm -hmm. like if, if you can, without feeling uncomfortable, be more specific, what for you, Mike Doyle, is the thing, obviously we don't get to decide, we can sign or not sign when they, when they right. send out, you know, the, the final agreement, but but I feel like everyone has different things and that are the most important to them. Mm -hmm. So do you know what is the most important to you that you go, I sign this comfortably because? Uh, uh, yes. Um, I don't know if I can put it in like a one sentence sort of distillation, but I think that streamers and studios uh, and corporations, because some of these players are corporations, are making a lot of money that is derived from the talent and uh, labor of a creative force. And there is a pie of, of revenue that comes out of that. And we're asking for our fair share of that pie. It's not half the pie. It's not three quarters of the pie. It's a sliver. And I think that is not a lot to ask. Uh, some might argue that we should ask for more. Um, but what is happening, as is uh, mirrored in many other professions, that there is a polarization of resources that are going to a very small select top few and everybody else is fighting for crumbs you know i've been doing this uh you know since my 20s and i can't tell you and i'm sure you you deal with this and dom i know must deal with this it's like you get an offer and you're like that that's less than i made 15 years ago and it's like how how is that possible? And it's like, do you want it? And they're like, yeah, I want it. Do you want to walk away from it? No. So we sign whatever because we feel, excuse me, we feel um, beholden in a way. Um, but now is the time where we're not signing and we're fighting and we're demanding more. Um, and so I, I, am, I am hopeful that like the Writers Guild, Screen Actors Guild, uh, will get the same fair deal. I mean, there are other things that are that are you know sort of existential, make or break uh, items, such as AI. Um, there, there are a lot of things. That said, when we get this contract people have to remember that this contract isn't going to right the wrongs of like a profession that is not a meritocracy. It's still going to be a hard, hard job and a hard life to be an artist, to be a creator. And I wish more than 85% of our union made more than $26,000 to qualify right. for, for health insurance. insurance. Yeah. But it's, I, I don't know that 
this strike or any strike will ever achieve that, um, mm-hmm. which is sad, you know, which is like, so that said, I am, I'm hopeful that, you know, I'm a hundred percent behind the negotiating committee about behind what they're doing. And in my commitment to staying unified with my friends and my union. Yeah. Well yeah. said, well said. Um, okay. Before I let you go, is there a little known fact about oh. Mike Doyle you can share? Oh gosh, a little known fact. Oh God, I should have prepared this, Alana. I didn't prepare this. Um, a little want, known. Uh, do you want to phone a friend? <laughs> can I? Can I get help? Uh, oh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Um, here, you have to talk a little bit, and I've okay. got to think of something. Okay. What have other people said? <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, we. It can be. Oh my God, I can't believe I forgot that. It can be. Uh, it can be said um, that you have a particular talent for. Uh, my particular talent is. Um, a little known fact. I mean, most people know a lot of the facts about me. Like I'm half Italian and I'm very loyal. Oh, a little known fact is I'm an Italian citizen. Um, but that's not really uh, what you're no, going but, for. But that, of course it is. I mean, that has been, first of all, Mike has gone through, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of paperwork, time, studying and effort that goes into if you are eligible to get citizenship in another country, it's not the easiest thing to do. So you, Mike Doyle, and people will be surprised that Mike Doyle is Italian, and that would be fair. (laughs) Um, That's a little known fact, has not only gone through the steps and the particular process one must go through to get an Italian passport, you have been studying Italian in Italy. When you can. So if you can just say goodbye uh, uh, to us in your best Italian. Arrivederci. Arrivederci, Mike. Whenever I see Mike, I'm like, pronto. That's all I remember, how you answer the telephone. Pronto. Um, Yeah, that's Um, that's a little known fact. Uh, Another little known fact. uh, I used to swim competitively. I don't know if that's a, yeah, that's a little known fact. You're so competitive. <laughs> I'm so competitive. You're so competitive. I love. I couldn't Mike throw Doyle. a ball, so I joined the drama club. But you can I swim. Swam. You swam, and you <laughs> pretty on and point. You, I, is that true? You can't throw a ball. Nor can I catch one. <laughs> I can't. It's terrible. All right, we're saying goodbye, and then we'll take this uh, to the in-person portion of this interview. I love you. I will I see you, you soon. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Thank Bye. you. This was great. Bye. This was great.